So welcome to the cryptocurrency decal. <clears throat> We're lecturing on Bitcoin history because it's important to understand the backgrounds and motivations of the people running the industry today. First, we're going to cover the most basic concepts relating to Bitcoin. You'll hear these over and over again, and then I'll outline the history um, in the lecture before we really dive in. Note that this lecture is not very representative. Um, because this is a history lecture, it's not nearly as technical as the rest of this course. All right, so some basic Bitcoin concepts. The name of this course is the Cryptocurrency Decal. A cryptocurrency is basically any currency that uses a digital currency that uses computer science, cryptography, and economics to verify transactions. So Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is also the first cryptocurrency, and it's generally considered the flagship cryptocurrency because uh, it is the most robust. Um, Bitcoin can refer to uppercase Bitcoin, meaning the specific protocol software community, or lowercase Bitcoins, the unit. And Bitcoin exists purely as software. So to use Bitcoin, I download wallet software somewhere, which will generate addresses for me. And if I want to receive Bitcoin, I give these addresses to other people. Trustless, decentralized, consensus. Wow, you're going to hear these terms a lot in the Bitcoin space. Um, so trustless basically means that you can use the Bitcoin network without having to rely on some third party. You guys know what decentralized means, uh, but decentralized consensus means that every node in the network agrees on the transaction history. <clears throat> so here are some of the innovative properties of Bitcoin. First off, it's an open financial network and it's pseudonymous, meaning that anyone can participate in the network and to participate, you don't require any personal information. It's pseudonymous, not anonymous, because there are ways in which you can link your identity to your Bitcoin address. Um, which we'll talk about later. It's borderless, meaning that I can send any amount from one cent to $10 million worth of Bitcoin anywhere in the world for six cents. So a lot of people say this is really good for remittances. Um, that's also a controversial view, um, which we will not cover. It's also censor censorship resistant and immutable. Uh, that also has its own caveat. It's mostly immutable, um, but by censorship resistant and immutable, we mean uh, there's irreversible payments and that generally what's in the blockchain can be considered the truth. There's no one who can shut down uh, or erase your transaction history. Mm. Lastly, it's also programmable money. Not that traditional money like US dollars isn't programmable, but the the fact that Bitcoin is an open financial network makes integration into existing systems a lot easier. So here are some of the use cases. We covered remittances. Uh, there's digital goods. So for example, if I'm selling a video game to someone, which is a, like a digital file, <clears throat> um, the irreversible payments are a really good thing to have with Bitcoin because once I've dispensed that good, the, the consumer can essentially just copy that good. Uh, and if they charge back their payment to me, then, then there's no way for me to really like punish them or you know, get, get that back. So with Bitcoin, the reversibility is, makes it the currency of choice for digital goods. There's also machine-to-machine -machine payments and Internet of Things. In general, Bitcoin is a really good currency for autonomous networks, uh, really good for easy in, easy out um, kind of networks where you have machines uh, talking to each other uh, through programs. Um, there's also micropayments. Also to say, like, not that uh, micropayments can be implemented in traditional currencies, but the openness of the financial network makes integration easier. And a lot of people also think of it as digital gold, as an alternative source of value, store of value. So here you can see some Grecians. This is a picture from Cointelegraph um, during the Grecian 
uh, debt crisis. And at this time, a lot of Grecians were buying up Bitcoin uh, because they viewed it as a much more stable currency than their own. So some of the basic data structures of Bitcoin, you'll probably want to take some notes on this. First, you have transactions, which are transfers of Bitcoin from input addresses to output addresses. You have blocks, which are timestamp collections of these transactions. <clears throat> and miners validate these transactions and put them into the blocks, which collectively form the blockchain. The blockchain you can think of as the entire history or the entire history of all of Bitcoin. Um, so miners are essentially competing to add blocks to the blockchain, and it's really difficult to add blocks. So this is why we consider the correct chain to be the longest chain, because we assume that no more than 51% of the network is going to be dishonest. Uh, lastly, a quick note on where Bitcoin gets its value. Bitcoin has value because people believe it has value. Um, you can measure Bitcoin's value in its exchange rate with US dollars, for example. There's a lot of arguments you can make, but we will not go into that here. So a quick overview of the history we'll be covering in this lecture. The different periods in Bitcoin history can be broken down into a few representative stories. There's a number of different eras, um, each with its own feel and uh, kind of its own characterization of what was going on. So before Bitcoin, you have libertarian dreams and ideals, which was what led to the development of Bitcoin. Uh, from 2010 to 2012, after Bitcoin kind of got off the ground, um, was a period of a lot of scandals and Ill illegal activity. Um, after that, Bitcoin started to attract attention, gaining merchant acceptance, gaining venture funding. And now, in the present, we have Bitcoin struggling to scale. We have the rise of the first alternative cryptocurrency that comes anywhere close to rivaling Bitcoin called Ethereum. And we have a renewed interest in blockchain technology from banks and larger financial institutions. All right, now I'm just gonna take it from here. So I'm gonna talk about um, pre-Bitcoin uh, before 2009. Um, and the cyberpunk movement. So, with the advance of technologies in, in the 1980s and 90s, the cyberpunk movement came into being. And so, their manifesto was, privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. And this movement had roots in two different uh, movements. So, one of them being libertarianism, which is a political ideology advocating the non-aggression principle in laissez-faire government as well as cryptography, which was a new tool that people had in the 80s and 90s that was innovating very rapidly. And cryptography is the science of securing communication in the presence of third parties. <clears throat> so as we can see uh, in, this, in this picture, um, when you think of cypherpunks and when you think of the crypto-anarchist movement, it's a very sketchy, you think of very sketchy things um, but the truth is that cyberpunks were just obsessed over how technology would change the relationship between the individual and the state. Um, they were hopeful about all the new tools that people had, but they, at the same time they were scared of the possible infringements on the privacy by the government and by big corporations. And by far, the biggest area that they were afraid of uh, and that they uh, most advocated was uh, freedom of currency, freedom of money. And so we have this guy, David Chom, who although he looks like a crazy hippie, was actually one of the first geniuses who, uh, advocate, who really uh, innovated in terms of digital currency. And so he created DigiCash, which is the most famous example of the early cryptocurrencies. The early cyberpunks viewed finance and the existing financial system as the greatest individual threats to liberty and to their personal security because they saw big banks and big government being able to see all their transactions 
being able to control all of their economic assets and really having a say in their private lives and they really dislike that and because of that we have uh, people like David Chom who used um, new innovations like public key cryptography and this this is a tool that allowed people to have blind digital signatures uh, which gave people the ability to sign off on transactions without providing any identifying information and this is important because it basically means that I can have transactions on my on my credit card or, or, or on this currency without people knowing who I am um, and this essentially protects my privacy in my transactions uh, however there's one very big issue with Digicash and Digicash was a central organization so this means that um, the entire currency was centralized around David Chom and his company which was also called Digicash and the problem was that when Digicash failed, the Digicash the company failed, Digicash the currency failed as well. And so libertarians and the crypto anarchists of this time learned from this mistake. And after that, they began, began to experiment with decentralized currency. And this is very, very important because it's, very, uh, it's an important innovation, an important step in the development of what would become Bitcoin. Um, so, Cyberpunks also worked on innovation in cryptography, of course, uh, and one of the most important innovations that they created was the cryptographic hash function. Uh, so put it, to put it very simply, a hash function is a mathematical equation that is easy to solve but hard to reverse engineer. And so in 1997, a guy named Adam Back created his own digital currency called Hashcash, and that required computers to solve hash functions in order to earn the currency and this ensured that his currency would be scarce and this scarcity that hashcash that hashcash innovated is now is now also within the bitcoin system and so that's why hashcash is an important other digital currency of this time period for the development of what is now bitcoin um, this process of solving functions to earn something became known as proof of work and it's in, it's a central innovation at the core of Bitcoin and we're going to learn more about it in upcoming lectures. Um, despite all of these different experiments uh, in the 80s and in the, in the 90s in the late 90s all of them continue to hit hurdles that resulted in failure but the important thing is that every single one contributed to cryptography to innovation uh, and they were important steps that eventually uh, allowed for the creation of Bitcoin. Um, and so now we're going to go to a guy named uh, Satoshi. So uh, 2009 and 2010, uh, these were the formative years of Bitcoin. So who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, a lot of people were very uh, curious about who this man was, and a lot of the... Uh, one funny incident was that they a lot of people believe this guy Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto was him, um, and he actually was harassed by uh, investigators and journalists. Um, but he was like, "Nope, it's not me." But uh, so we actually don't know who he is. Um, he's an anonymous creator of Bitcoin uh, who wrote a nine-page white paper that brilliantly combined all previous efforts to create a self-sustaining digital currency. Um, some people even believe that he's not one person but rather multiple people. Um, there's one pro there was a, a very big group of people who believed that uh, this currency would fail among the cyberpunk movement um, because they are very much disheartened by the early failures of the 1990s. Uh, however, important there's an important minority like Hal Finney was another pioneer of the cyberpunk movement who supported the project as the solution. Um, and this was because this white paper uh, really demonstrated uh, and, and combined all of the different um, innovations that they, that they created in the 90s. 
And we're going to get to this white paper later, but it demonstrated the first digital currency that was practically viable. And this is really important in the history of uh, Bitcoin because it's the beginning, really. Um, and so the first the Bitcoin block, although also known as the Genesis block, was mined on January 3, 2009. And this block is very important because it points to the libertarian beginnings and the libertarian roots of Bitcoin. Uh, the Coinbase of the Genesis block references a story in the Times of London newspaper involving the Chancellor bailing out banks. And this was the very thing that angered and pissed off so many libertarians and cypherpunks because uh, it, it, this news uh, showed that banks and government were colluding with, the, with each other uh, in order to basically screw the public and the taxpayer. Um, and so, the, for libertarians, this was unacceptable. Uh, and that's why we have Bitcoin. Um, the first Bitcoin transaction occurred on January 12, 2009 uh, with Hal Finney, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and these basically were the first real s steps in, in Bitcoin history. Uh, probably the most famous uh, event of this of these two years was uh, the the event of the six million dollar pizza, in which a guy named Laszlo Hanyex on May 21, 2010, purchased twenty five dollars worth of pizza for ten thousand Bitcoin. Um, now this was the world's first ever Bitcoin transaction for a tangible asset, and ten thousand Bitcoin is now equivalent at the time of writing to five million seven hundred ninety thousand dollars. Uh, it's really important, however, to understand why this purchase was so important. Because before this purchase, no one thought that you could use Bitcoin, uh, or most people who were involved in Bitcoin were hobbyists, and m none of them believed that you could use Bitcoin to purchase real-world assets, real-world goods. However, after this purchase, uh, it became clear that Bitcoin is more than just a hobby, it was now a actual currency. And so this is why it's so re re revolutionary uh, as a purchase. Um, and so now I'm going to go on to the most uh, interesting part of Bitcoin history, which was the years of scandals, of hacks, and of illegal activity. And we're going to talk about two different companies that really represented these two years. One of them being uh, Mt. Gox. And so Mt. Gox was established in 2010 and consolidated itself as the biggest Bitcoin exchange during the beginning stages of Bitcoin. And by 2013, Mt. Gox was handling around 70% of all company transactions. Um, so there are definitely a lot of scandals in Mt. Gox history, but by far the most important two are, the first of which are um, on January 19, 2011, Mt. Gox suffered a significant breach of security uh, that resulted in fraud, uh, fraudulent trading, and required the site of its shutdown for seven days. And this breach uh, basically compromised the entire database. Uh, it leaked the user table that con contained usernames, email addresses, and password hashes of 60,000 accounts. But the more important scandal, uh, the more important uh, event, it was in 2014, Mt. Gox lost 744,408 Bitcoins in a theft that went unnoticed for years. So somehow this company lost 750,000 Bitcoins and it just disappeared under their noses. Uh, but um, kind of a basic understanding of what happened was an admin account was accessed from which sell orders were issued for hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins, which forced the Mt. Gox price down from $17.51 to one cent per Bitcoin. Uh, and eventually, Mt. Gox actually declared bankruptcy um, because of these events. And the other uh, Bitcoin scandal was Silk Road. So Silk Road was the website in which you bought all the good things in life, including... Uh, 
uh, cocaine, weed, and uh, assorted goods. Um, so on January 2011, uh, February 2011, uh, Silk Road opened for business, uh, selling all sorts of drugs and all sorts of other goodies uh, on the black market. And it was also known as the eBay for drugs. Uh, on October 2013, uh, the FBI shut down Silk Road, seizing $3.6 million worth of Bitcoin. And Ross Ulbricht, the founder of uh, Silk Road, is currently serving a life sentence without possibility of parole. So the lesson we can learn from this is, number one, Bitcoin was extremely, extremely scandalous, and its name is still tinged with scandal even today. And number two, you should not sell drugs. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about the bubble. So this, this bubble was probably one of the most uh, interesting events to ever happen in uh, really modern financial history. Uh, so between November 1, 2013 and November 30, 2013, the price of Bitcoin grew from $198.23 to $1,165.89. Um, and in late 2013, the Bitcoin bubble hit its peak at that very price uh, before suddenly bursting and entering a bearish run that lasted all the way until late 2015. Um, and that's not even to talk about the earlier bubble. The, that, that, that's not even to talk about what happened before, uh, in which Bitcoin grew from a mere three cents all the way to $1,165.89. Um, so there are possible reasons for this bubble. Uh, one of them is uh, Chinese investors. So whenever you have a Bitcoin scandal, it usually involves blaming China or blaming Chinese investors for being speculative financial uh, investors. Um, and so the burst of the bubble, some people believe, was caused by the gov Chinese government's announcement that, uh, that they would begin regulating Bitcoin. Um, and so as soon as that occurred, a lot of Chinese investors were like, I'm out. I can't, I can't take this. And so... That's one possible reason. But another possible reason is, uh, again, Mt. Gox. So Mt. Gox bots like BullyBot or Marcus Bot, they drove the price up by continuously buying up Bitcoin. And so they had a lot of special clearances from Mt. Gox. Uh, there was a lot of very sketchy things about these bots. But basically, they continue to buy Bitcoin um, and really were influential in, in increasing the price. Uh, now I'm going to talk about what happened after. So the aftermath of all of this, all of this bubble was pretty much the worst years in terms of Bitcoin price history ever. Uh, 2014 was the worst year on record of Bitcoin's price history, falling by 67% from $800 to $320 a coin. And... By 2015, uh, Bitcoin had fell to a low of $170, but right now, uh, it, has, it has grown all the way back up to around $600. So we can see um, Bitcoin price uh, history is very volatile, and it's also one way of looking at Bitcoin history itself. And so now I'm going to hand it back to Max, and he's going to talk about... Uh, getting attention in 2013. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so I think a good way to capture the spirit of 2014 is to browse through some of the headlines from that time. So these are all from Coindesk. Uh, in 2014 was the year that Mt. Gox lost $350 million in Bitcoin, uh, that huge hack. Um, it was rumored to be insolvent. This was also the year when Newsweek released a really clickbaity article claiming to have found Satoshi Nakamoto by looking up Satoshi Nakamoto in a phone book, um, you know, hiding in plain sight. Uh, and there was also a lot of just hype in general. Tim Draper, uh, despite the, the price declining, he claimed Bitcoin's price is still headed to $10,000. <clears> uh, 
2014 was also a year when you could start using your Bitcoin to buy a lot of stuff, including uh, porn, marijuana from vending machines, uh, Xbox games, and my favorite. Uh, you could also package up uh, boxes of horse poop and send it to someone that you don't like with a personalized message. And this service was called Shit Express. Twenty thirteen to twenty fourteen also saw a rise in venture capital interest in Bitcoin startups. So I want to talk about Coinbase because the size of Coinbase is representative of investor interest. Coinbase is an online wallet exchange. They make it really easy for you to buy, sell, and hold Bitcoin. Um, they were founded June twenty twelve, enrolled in uh, Y Combinator, and in May twenty thirteen they had their five million dollars Series A. This is pretty small at the at this point. Um, and then in December 2013, they raised a $25 million Series B. Uh, this is significant because it was actually the largest funding of a Bitcoin related startup at the time. Um, fast forward to July 2015, they raised a $75 million Series C. And they actually didn't need the funding for, they didn't actually need to raise another round. And they actually did it because they saw that investor interest was moving away from Bitcoin itself and more towards general blockchain technology. Um, you'll notice that after this time, there's not too many um, large Bitcoin startups that have been funded because everyone's now focusing on blockchain tech. <clears throat> um, so here are some of the relevant startups in the space today. So we mentioned Coinbase. Bitfinex is an online exchange and trading platform. We have uh, 21 Inc. that does machine to machine payments and embedded mining. They used to be an ASIC chip company founded by Balaji Srinivasan down at Stanford. We have BitPay, which allows merchants to accept Bitcoin for payment and convert to US dollars. Uh, so basically allowing anyone to accept another alternative form of payment and drawing in a unique crowd. We have ChangeTip, which I'm plugging because I personally used to work there for a year. Uh, ChangeTip is a social Bitcoin micropayments platform where you can send money to anyone uh, on the internet with just their social media tag. Uh, you simply comment their name and an amount and Bitcoin, sends, or, or Bitcoin is sent to them through ChangeTip. And last, you have Blockstream. Uh, Blockstream is essentially... Uh, Andreessen Horowitz threw a bunch of money at the Bitcoin ecosystem because they wanted to ensure that their other Bitcoin startups wouldn't die because of Bitcoin itself dying. So Blockstream contains a lot of the Bitcoin core team, which maintains the software of Bitcoin. Blockstream, Blockstream's product is sidechains, and they also do a lot of research. Some really smart people over at Blockstream. Uh, here's a quick splash of some more Bitcoin startups and when they had their seed rounds. Um, yeah, Circle is kind of like a Coinbase, except Bitcoin's under the hood. Coinolytics de-anonymizes the blockchain. Bitco does security. Uh, we have Chain working on uh, private blockchains. Uh, we have blockchain, like blockchain.info, which is a block explorer, and there's ChangeTip. All right, so from 2015 to the present, um, Bitcoin started to struggle to scale. In 2015, a small technical detail started becoming a problem. So Bitcoin blocks are created every 10 minutes, but in 2015, this block size limit was reduced to one megabyte to pre prevent denial of service attacks, spamming the network, etc. However, what this means is that we've essentially set a hard cap to the volume of transactions that can flow through Bitcoin. And in 2015, uh, from normal Bitcoin use, these blocks started to fill up, meaning that a lot of transactions were waiting unconfirmed on the network for hours. Uh, so clearly this is a huge scalability problem because Bitcoin's nowhere near ubiquity and we're already running into a bottleneck. And this, there was a debate on whether or not we should raise this block size limit uh, or if we should keep it the same, called, and it was referred to as a block science debate. It really divided the community, um, 
and it's significant because it really raised question. Like, in a in a community of technically minded and often paranoid libertarians and crypto anarchists, how do you come upon a consensus? Like, how do you approach decentralized governance? This is something we'll be talking about a lot more in lecture nine: community and regulation. <clears throat> I also think the Lightning Network is worth mentioning simply because it's the most popular proposed solution to scalability. Um, essentially, it allows you to make secure payments um, without actually clearing every transaction on the blockchain. Um, we'll be covering this a lot more in depth in Lecture 11, Scalability, but it's a really cool thing. You'll we'll get to learn about uh, things like hash time lock contracts, state channels, uh, what check lock time verify is, just to throw some buzzwords at you. All right, and from 2015 to the present, Ethereum blows up in multiple ways. So what's Ethereum? Um, Bitcoin is based off a really simple stack-based programming language. Um, that's partially why it's considered very robust and secure, just because it's so simple. Um, essentially, Vitalik Buterin, um, this genius, young genius, Teal Fellow, uh, he thought, okay, we can extend Bitcoin scripting language to be Turing complete. So Ethereum is basically a Turing complete version of Bitcoin. And there's huge ramifications because you can now think of <clears throat> any, uh, any app that you can build in a centralized way today can now be built in a decentralized way on the Ethereum network. So even if there aren't good business ideas, good app ideas that exist today, the sheer complexity that Ethereum enables uh, has a good potential for a killer app. <clears throat> so Ethereum also started just like uh, most other crypto projects do. They started with a white paper um, in 2013. They had a crowd sale. Uh, and in 2015, or, and in May 2016, the value of Ethereum tokens was worth more than $1 billion. Uh, this is the first time that any alternative cryptocurrency, or any cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin, passed that $1 billion mark. Um, there was actually a huge price increase. I was personally invested in the Ethereum crowd sale for $60, and as of today, it's worth over $3,000. So yeah, that was a pretty good investment. <clears throat> just to give you kind of the scale of how Ethereum grew. Um, Ethereum also has potential for new governance models. So the first way in which Ethereum blew up was in its market cap and its price. But the second way was in this new experiment called the DAO. DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and it was essentially a crowdfunded uh, venture pool where anyone could come in and submit proposals for projects to be funded, and then the token holders in the pool would vote on whether or not they should fund that project. Well, despite all the security audits and research that was done into the DAO, uh, someone found an exploit and managed to steal $120 million uh, out of the DAO. So then what happened was like $120 million like, note that Ethereum is worth more than $1 billion. That's like 10% of the total market cap of Ethereum. Ethereum uh, users and the community didn't think it was safe for to have 10% of the money controlled by one entity, one anonymous entity that hacked the DAO. So the underlying network forked to a version of Ethereum where uh, the attacker didn't get his funds. But then there's a lot of people who really believe in the immutability of the blockchain and they continued in protest on the old chain. And then some exchanges starting, started listing those old chains, the old chain called Ethereum Classic on their exchange on their, uh, as one of their currency trading pairs. So now what you essentially have is this quantum superposition of Ethereum where the currency has essentially split into two in one version where the attacker got his money and in the other version where the attacker did not. <clears throat> All right, so lastly, we have an interest in blockchain from banks. 
quote blockchain. So these are called private blockchains or permission ledgers. Uh, they share a lot of the same elements as Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but there's a few key differences. First off, it's not an open financial network. Uh, it's not trustless, and there's no economic incentives like in Bitcoin. Uh, you can kind of think of this as like the bankers saw Bitcoin as this dirty word associated with drugs, money laundering, uh, Silk Road, uh, like scandals. Um, oh, like get, let's get away from Bitcoin and take out the uh, take the underlying technology, the blockchain, this neutral word. This blockchain is going to revolutionize everything. Um, some of the cons of this are that it doesn't use consensus properly. So it's not really taking advantage of the key uh, innovation of Bitcoin. And what they're really doing in a lot of their applications of Bitcoin is they're using the blockchain as glorified public key cryptography with an append-only log. You know, uh, they're not actually using Bitcoin for, or, or I should say blockchain technology for what, like the really innovative properties that it produced. However, there are some benefits. Uh, private blockchains in general tend to be more compliant because you know exactly who you're interacting with on the network. We'll cover this a lot more in lecture six, alternative consensus and enterprise blockchain. <clears throat> so here are some of the major private blockchain initiatives that you'd hear about in the space. We have R3CV, which is a consortium of over 60 large major financial institutions, like think bold fractal bracket banks and uh, insurance companies. Um, they're essentially working together as a conglomeration to create a blockchain solution. Startup is, I mean, uh, Chain is a startup tackling the same problem, um, working with uh, NASDAQ uh, to try to tailor a blockchain to their needs. And we also have digital asset holdings. So you might remember the financial crisis of 2008 uh, those that largely came about because of the credit default swap, which was invented by Blythe Masters, who was at J.P. Morgan Chase at the time. Now Blythe Masters is the founder of Digital Asset Holdings, so it'll be really interesting to see what she does in the crypto space. Uh, Digital Asset Holdings uh, runs the Hyperledger or owns the Hyperledger project, which is essentially this open source blockchain and the Linux Foundation is leading development on it. IBM also had their own blockchain initiatives, but they've, they've since been merged into the Hyperledger project, and JP Morgan has their own project, or their own blockchain project called Juno. So one way to gauge how large financial institutions came to view blockchain is to look at what Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, has said about Bitcoin and blockchain over time. So first he said, it's a terrible store of value. It can be replicated over and over. Uh, this is kind of representative of how at the time people still didn't quite understand Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin can't in fact be replicated over and over. Uh, you can copy the software, but unless you get other people to join you, like it's not gonna work. In October, 2014, he said, Bitcoin developers are gonna try to eat our lunch. That's called competition and we'll be competing. It's almost as if he's conceding legitimacy to Bitcoin. In November 2015, <clears throat> he said, no government will ever support a virtual currency that goes around borders and doesn't have the same control. It's not going to happen. It's, you know, not to read into his words too much, but like, bankers hate this lack of control. You know, perhaps Jamie Dimon feels threatened by this notion of uh, Bitcoin and virtual currency that's like decentralized. Uh, no central point of failure. And lastly, we come to February 2016, where he's completely turned around. He says the blockchains, the technology which we've been studying, could probably reduce the cost of real application in certain things. Uh, if it proves to be cheap and securely adopted for a whole bunch of stuff. So this is returning back to the notion of, oh, Bitcoin's a dirty word. But if we separate blockchain out from that, that's perfect. That'll solve all our problems. Blockchain, everything. And bam. Now we've gone to JP Morgan Chase, starting with the cypherpunk movement. <clears throat> Just look at the legitimacy of this slide. 
uh, just look at you know the institutionalism, I should say. Compare that with Israeli hippie David Chaum right here. Uh, Bitcoin's definitely come a long way. Uh, so really, the the history of Bitcoin and blockchain technology is a story of rapid transformation, originating as a fledgling technology founded on libertarian ideals. Bitcoin found its beginnings in an industry full of scandals and illicit activity. As, be as Bitcoin began to rise in value and attract attention from a wider and wider audience, there was a shift in focus away from Bitcoin itself and more into the innovations made possible by the underlying technology called the blockchain. <clears throat> All right, so for next class, um, make sure to join our Facebook group, Cryptocurrency Decal. Uh, this is essentially a group for questions, announcements, and follow-up discussions. Uh, if, you, if you don't have Facebook or if you don't want to join the group for some reason, just email us and that's totally fine. Um, and some of our oh, required readings are we have a five-minute video on Bitcoin Works. This is to establish a like, basic understanding of, of consensus in preparation for our consensus lecture. We have the Bitcoin Developer Guide, which will go a little more into detail on, uh, you know, at a high level, how Bitcoin all works together. And some of our extra readings, which are pretty interesting. So the Willig Report is an investigation into uh, public data that was released from Mt. Gox. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting, uh, um, it's, it's almost like a conspiracy theory, a really, really suspicious things that Mount Gox did, perhaps, and they think maybe Mark Carpellas did uh, during the whole time that um, Mount Gox might have been insolvent. <clears throat> we have an excerpt on digital gold on early uh, Bitcoin development, which is a story about this teenager, European teenager named Marty, who's really shy, uh, did, barely knew how to code, but he was actually one of the most crucial components of Bitcoin in its very early days. And we also have the old untold story of Silk Road, which is a fantastic wired piece. It's a deep dive into Silk Road and the story of Ross Ulbricht. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of marginal, but it's a very interesting read nonetheless. Um, yeah, I think that's it. You can find all this information available at bitcoin.berkeley.edu slash decal.